situations and issues and personalities. Um, all of these are things that you find at every level of politics, whether it be you know at the city, um, at the state level, um, at the national level, at the federal level. I, I'm pretty intrigued by it. I think that um, I think that the parts that might be tedious, as you're suggesting, um, will be accompanied by lots of really interesting and important. Um, details that really need to be attended to, and I look forward to that. I'm, I'm not hearing that you're, you're talking about those connections because I think we, you know, the, the city council, or in cases that I feel like have town meeting, that, um, that they really are part of the holiday field or a metaphor for what happens. And if, if we can make the changes in our town, if we can open it up, if we can have a and which is not to say that we're not transparent, but I think if we can model the way a government should be, even on a city level, it can be a, a model for other people to aspire to. Well, I think I think there's reciprocity between all levels of the government in this country, and um, you know I think when when people talk about local government, I think they think that it can be very parochial. But one of the things that's really fascinating to me and important to me as somebody who would like to be part of the city council is that there is a very clear relationship between what is happening at the state level and what is happening at the federal level and how there, that trickles down to what we're dealing with here at the local level in Northampton. And I'm talking about things from funding to um, the recent resolution on drones. I think all of that is quite relevant to city politics, and um, especially the funding right now. You know, we are in a terrible jam in Northampton, as cities throughout the country are. And part of that jam comes from the fact that here in Western Massachusetts, we're not getting proportional uh, financial support from the State House, and I really hope to be part of a regional block of. Uh, of folks working with cities from Greenfield to Holyoke, Northampton, of course, to Springfield, who are going to really work to lobby in the Massachusetts State House to shift the way in which the formulae are set up for funding, for block grant funding. Um, I think we also have, there is room to actually influence how the feds are sending funding to states that then comes down to the local level. And, and I do think that that's absolutely the role and the obligation of those of us who will be sitting in the Northampton City Council to attend to. So I, I really do think that there is a way in which we have to think of at all those levels, on all those levels. Uh, it's interesting to hear you say that because I've, I've just spent some time with, with um, Crystal Seven, who has been traveling around the country searching for Occupy and really talking with people all around the country who are expressing a lot of these same concerns. And then I think when you talk about our, our 91 corridor, our, our, our Pioneer Valley, working together, that, that you do have a, a little more help than any one of the cities working in their own. And, uh, and the people, subsequently, I think, when the media is really following us and paying attention, I think feel that they're part of something bigger and not so disenfranchised. I know, and, and, and I heard this, and uh, I, it's one of the questions I ask lots of folks. Did you grow up here where you can't fight city <laughs> I have heard that phrase, yes, and I did hear it growing up. And, and it, I think it's a very interesting phrase, and I, I think it's, it, it's probably a derivative of how the people in this country have since its inception been anti-government. So it's not like any other government that or country that has a long-term democratic history. I mean, the French people don't hate their government uh, or distrust it, or the Germans or the Swiss or the Spanish or you know, the most European democracies that have had long-standing democracies don't have that sense that we can't trust the government. That there's a sense that this is our government. And, and I'm curious about whether that, that 
one of the messages, one of the mantras is you can't trust city council because you can't trust the president, you can't trust your Congress. There's this not trust, which is fertile ground for groups like the Tea Party and, and others to be really anti. And I'm heartened when someone like you, a thinking person, says, I really want to, and I'm going to put up with the team of you know, road repairs and the things that have to be dealt with at the city level to also build a vision of that connectedness between our city, the commonwealth, and the nation. You know, I think um, this is an interesting thread of discussion, but what stands out to me most in it is exactly what pulled me into being interested in city politics as opposed to um, you know, focusing more uh, more at that state or federal level, although of course, as I've said, I want to integrate that into the work that I do. But what's really heartening and exciting and fascinating to me about city politics is that I will have a relationship with my constituents, the people that I'm representing, that is really unique, that is very... Um, very personal. You know, I've started, over the last month, I've been doing door knocking and going from house to house in Ward 7 and speaking with folks and asking them, tell me about your concerns. I have the luxury, because I'm running at the city level, of making those connections with people, like really walking into their homes. People are incredibly kind, and, and I'm actually finding that they're really, they want to talk. They're very excited that somebody is coming to them and saying, tell me about your issues right here in Ward 7, in your backyard. Um, what do you want from city government? What do you need? People have a lot to say. And I am reporting all of it dutifully and figuring out how to, in fact, work it into what I hope to do should I be elected to city council. Um, and that is a really unique thing, that when you work at that city level, as opposed to as a state rep or state senator or, you know, at the federal level, you know your constituents personally. You live next door to a good portion of the people that you're going to represent. And I'm, I'm really excited by that and really happy to be making these new connections and creating new relationships with the people who live in my ward who I would represent as a city councilor. Do you think that um, that your going door to door and engaging with people is is liberating them to really talk about what they want and restoring perhaps some faith in government? I, I do. I think so. I, I mean, I think the proof is going to be in the pudding. Should I be elected, and you know, how am I going to be able to represent faithfully um, sometimes very divergent views? And that, to me is one of the things that really motivated me to get involved and to run for office is that I think um, there has to be a way to figure out as frequently as possible, as often as possible, how to allow divergent voices to come forward and for people with divergent views to be supported. I think the recent override vote in Northampton is a perfect example for how, um, you know, many people are crying uh, divisiveness, divisiveness, you know, the city is, is becoming split. I think it's being overplayed. I do think, though, that as a city councilor for Ward 7, which, which uh, tends to be the most conservative ward, I think, along with Ward 6, the most conservative ward in Northampton, um, I have to figure out how to represent both of those views, how to bring, to, to meet the needs, essentially, of the folks who did not vote for the override because they're truly concerned that they're getting overpriced, they're, they're getting pushed out of their homes. Um, I heard from a number of people in Ward 7 that their children have to live in Chicopee or Springfield because they can't afford to live in Northampton, and it's breaking their hearts because the tax table is just too high at this point. I, um, as someone who did support the override and who believes we needed to do that, I also need to be able to listen to them and represent them well and figure out other ways, new ways, to meet their needs as well. And I think that, just hearing that, is, is quite refreshing because I think one of the things that, that historically happens in politics is that it really does become this bifurcation 
that either you're for this or against it. And if you're for it, you gang up with the four people. And if you're against it, you gang up with the against people. And in fact, um, there's a lot of overlap. That there's probably nobody who doesn't want to have good schools. Um, and there is nobody who wants people to be pushed out of their homes. So how do we find, how do we in, enable a, a different way of conversation about this that, that allows us to be creative and to work beyond the of Right, right. That's exactly, that's exactly kind of, I think, the, the, the kernel of, um, it's, you know, the conundrum, the kernel, the problem that I think we um, all in Northampton have to be grappling with is how do we take seriously these divergent or what are being expressed as divergent needs when, in fact, you know, there is that similarity, I think, amongst all citizens of Northampton. That yes, they want the best schools that we can possibly have. We want to make this an affordable place to live. We want people who have been longtime homeowners in Northampton, generational homeowners in Northampton, to be able to remain in Northampton and to have their kids remain with them in Northampton. Um, I don't think there's anyone that would want that not to happen. But the question is, how do we do that? How do we find the revenue streams for the city? Um, how do we scrutinize the budget and make sure that we're spending wisely um, so that we don't have to continue to ask for overrides? Um, I think there are a lot of creative ways we can do that. I think that the, the most important piece here is looking for solutions, not just uh, moaning and groaning and complaining and pointing fingers and accusing, and which is what I think happens. Um, I think that we need to scrutinize the budget. We need to be looking um, for where we can cut things and where we can create new revenue streams. But we need to be finding practical solutions at the same time. Uh, I, you know, as, as I'm listening to you, one of the things that really resonates with me is some of the, the things that are happening um, in, in, in the Commonwealth for folks who are looking at the budget for all and people are looking to really examine the, the, the way the federal budget is spent, is, is allocated, and how so much of it is going into the And that but we know that with all of the money that is going into There's nobody I think that there's any safety for the Nathan News in the past 24 hours and heard about how American citizens traveling in the Philippines and the world are probably in many other places. There's this alert that um, the American citizens are not safe in other places. And this is, this is a, a major, major historical shift. And so we've, we've got this major military spending that um, is, is having a problem with what it feels like a hysteria. And, uh, and that's not good for anybody. I was, was watching people on, uh, who are uh, protesting their low wages and fast food employees. And I thought, now, I, I'm not an economist, but the economist I've talked to say, if the people have more money, they will spend it. If the super wealthy have more money, they won't. They'll keep investing in other places. But if low income people, people who are weakening, have more money, they have more dollars, they'll spend it. And that's good for the economy. And so, so I think the, the, the people who are doing Runaway, and I mean, it's, it's historic because it's Eisenhower noted that every congressional district, once I did a research about 20 years ago, I think there were two congressional districts in the entire country who did not have military contracts. And if, you, if that's the only thing you can Subsidized because they were getting federal dollars to make windmills and solar panels 
they would be as happy, the engineers would be as happy making levels as they are making parts and drawings and other things. So it's, uh, it's really quite a challenge, and I think it's not that removed from the city council. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing us back to that kind of um, broad view of how city politics and, uh, and what's happening at the national level really affect one another. That, that is part of the platform that I'm running on, is really developing more of a relationship with what is happening at the national level, because it does very much affect us here. Um, I, think, I think there are ethical issues and moral issues, and I think that there are financial issues. And um, I, I love the work of the National Priorities Project, for instance, that really looks at what, is in fact, how in fact are our towns and cities and individuals in our towns and cities being affected by the fact that we're spending, uh, what percentage of our federal budget is it for the military? I mean, it's just astronomical. Between past, present, and future wars, it's well over 50%. And yeah, let's give a shout out to that National Priorities Project. Our home form started by Greg But it, it really is an important dimension because they, they do look at their members. And so the people who were opposed to the overlap, for example, when they look at if we not so much question it just on this very neighborly or unneighborly situation where I'm here for it and you can afford it and I'm against it because I can't afford it or I'm afraid. But to, to go back and get a broader perspective right. that this isn't a uniquely more issue. It, it has its own specificities, but uh, it's part of the, the whole out of control military project. And when the National Priorities Project gives us the information, then that's when you and the city councilors, the familiar, and the other members of the back the back of and help you better to say no. Uh, yeah, I think that um, it, it's about priorities, and we have to be at the city level. We have to be examining what our priorities here in the city are, but really understanding how those priorities are being affected by uh, politics at the state level and at the federal level, and um, and giving voice to what our city wants from the state and from the feds. Um, there was a recent city council meeting, I think it was actually about Guantanamo, we were talking about Guantanamo yes. earlier, um, where uh, one of the city councilors, in fact my, my opponent, Gene Tacey, said that it was above his pay grade to express his opinion um, through a resolution on closing Guantanamo. And I was really struck by uh, the president of the city council, Bill Dwight's response to him, uh, which was, no, this is exactly our pay grade. We as city councilors have, uh, have the obligation to support the Bill of Rights, to support the Constitution of the United States, and to ensure that our voices here in this city are being heard at the federal level about what we want our money being spent on, what we want being done to people, not done to people. And I absolutely agree with that. I think that we have a moral, fiscal, uh, ethical obligation in this city and as city councilors to, um, to have a voice, to give voice to our concerns about what's happening at all those levels. That's only one of the things that 
It's not just about me taking action, and it's kind of kind of along the lines of what you're saying about you know uh, constituents need to hold their elected officials accountable. I, I do think that that's true, but I also think that what is special about local politics, and one of the reasons again why I was really drawn to running for office, is that there is so much room for partnership between our elected officials and citizens of Northampton and constituents um, of our elected officials to work together. I think the, way, the whole way that the, the city is, the, the city government is set up is such that there is so much room for partnership. We have committees, we have a human rights commission, we have a tree committee, we have a parking um, and traffic commission. I mean, the, the list is very long and it's actually one of the wonderful things is that I'm learning so much about how city government works, and I really encourage folks to go to northampton.gov to look at the, the all of the different committees and commissions that you can serve on. And my vision and the operationalizing, as you said, um, my work um, as part of city council, should I be elected, to me feels like it's also about kind of um, invigorating Ward 7 with that sense that together, in partnership with me as a representative on the city council, residents of Ward 7 can really effectuate change. I think that they can get onto those committees, they can um, work to chair committees, to really have a voice in how all these different parts, you know, almost like a patchwork quilt, work together to, um, to actually make the city be what we want the city to be. And I know that sounds Pollyanna-ish, but I do believe that it's possible with more of a sense, if that city councilors do have that sense that uh, the, rep the people that they're representing, their constituents, are in fact partners in this running of the city, I think, um, I think we really can make change, positive change. Well, do you think that this is a, a a shift, not simply in, in this particular election, but, but historically, has the city council been this, this willing to engage with the citizens? I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I have always felt, I mean, I've for a long time been involved in different kinds of activist work in Northampton and have called upon city officials a number of times to uh, to bring a resolution forward. Um, I've come with issues related to my neighborhood, uh, to both committees, city committees, and to uh, elected officials. So I've always been engaged at that level. I, I don't know historically, though I couldn't say. Uh, I'm interested what you think about that, Paki. Um, I, well, I, I was very much disconnected from, from city government for a long time. But I, I lived in North Africa for a while and moved the way the peers still stayed in the valley and came back and the great bank is so I'm back home. But um but 
there, there seems to be a shift in the, the people who are on the city council to, to want more engagement by the citizens. And I remember years ago, Right. And again, I think that's the beauty of city politics. I think there is a lot of room for people to be involved. I think there's a lot of room for people to influence the direction of how the city, uh, the decisions the city makes. I'm also thinking about uh, the panhandling ordinance a couple of years ago. There was huge outcry around that, and that wasn't passed. So, uh, you know, I think uh, I love grassroots activism. I and that's really those are my roots. That's where I come from. Um, I'm essentially a community organizer at heart, and I love to see people get involved in those ways. And I think, you know, I, I gave those examples of um, getting onto city committees and commissions and things. But you alluded, Paki, to. Um, these other ways. People can speak out, people can be heard, people can give voice to what they want in myriad ways, whether it be marches and protests to coming to city council meetings and speaking during the public, uh, the public uh, speaking time, to, um, to organizing, to passing resolutions, to bringing resolutions forward via one of the city councilors. There are so many ways to influence. And then, of course, you know, not necessarily through city government, just uh, being involved in organizations that you believe in and care about, starting your own new uh, you know, block of folks who's interested in a particular thing, whether it be um, issues related to poverty. Sometimes people find organizations in the city that they want to hook up with. Sometimes they start their own. But that's that's. To me, that's what makes a city vibrant, and that's why I love Northampton and why I um, I want to be more involved in in the city government, but also so that um, I can be I can play a role in kind of activating people in all different ways. I have uh, two two concerns that I don't know if you've really been in a position to respond to, but one is when your constituents and I and others. Both, both those who are old and, uh, and people who are other people who have been living in the house uh, want to live in the city. Is there any movement afoot to 
really focus on building moderate uh, affordable housing. Um, I know years ago, involved in that and I wish I knew more so that I could kind of fill you in that is of great interest to me and you know there's a learning curve here in getting involved in city politics and um, and running for city council just so much that I'm learning every day I'm meeting with folks um, that work for city government that just constituents um, just trying to kind of learn everything I can about every issue that's coming down the pike, everything that I want to work on if I am elected. Um, and that's one of those things that I am really interested in. Affordable housing, I think mixed income housing, mixed use um, kinds of uh, structures and places to live, I, I think all of that is of um, extraordinary importance to our city so that people can remain in Northampton. Well, well, uh, once you're elected, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, the other thing that uh, I'm really curious about is the, uh, the controversial override. And, uh, and it was interesting to hear you say earlier on that you thought that was perhaps more, um, that there's more hype about the controversy. And I'm curious about whether when you talk with your constituents or whether whether um, whether you think that it has been so divisive that people don't talk to each other? Um, just yeah, that's it's an interesting, an interesting question. I've talked to many people in in the part of Florence that is Ward Seven and in Leeds who were against the override and who expressed to me kind of what I was saying before that they feel like they're getting priced out of Northampton. Their children have been priced out of Northampton. Can't live with them. Um, so I've heard that a lot. One of the things that I love about Leeds, where I live, is that despite some, some kinds of class differences or cultural differences amongst the residents of Leeds, people are neighbors and we talk to each other. So that I, I think that's one of the incredible strengths of Leeds and Florence. Um, I think that there is a little bit of a movement afoot and I think just a few individuals are responsible for it, of creating that sense that it's creating this division where people won't talk to each other and neighbors aren't talking to neighbors. I'm not finding that. I am, um, I am hearing individual, individuals and particular families talking about their frustration with the city and city government around the overrides, but. Um, I think they're also really open to hearing about ideas for alternatives and ways that we can ensure that they stay in their homes despite the fact that they're going to be paying more in taxes. Um, I, I think that if you bring creative solutions and ideas and, and even just brainstorming, the, the openness to brainstorming to people, that's, that, that is much more useful than just pointing fingers and just crying foul. And, um, and that's exactly what I'd like to change in Word 7, is really kind of acknowledging that we can talk about these things, that we can try and find creative solutions, that everybody's voice matters, whether they see themselves as progressives, whether they see themselves as conservative, whether they see themselves as old hamp, whether they see themselves as transplants to Ward 7. I really want to try and not just bridge those gaps, but give everybody a voice around the issues that they perceive as their particular issues. And I, I think, you know, if I'm listening to you, I'm smiling because I'm glad my heart to 
create this because I, I think this is how we do it. You know, we, we, we can get people with different ideas together um, to come together to be open to listen to what what different attitudes are, what different things are, what different aspirations are, and to, to look at how how it can be resolved, how some of this can be resolved on the board level, how some of it has to be done citywide, and how some of it has to be done up and down the, the, uh, the valley, or perhaps commonwealth-wise. And, and it's, it's, it's a, it, what it brings to me is, is this really an appreciation of the depth of the need for community. And that, that when we are working together, we can come up with something that none of us can do alone. And that if we really want a compilation that's something we want to have a democracy, that's what we have to do. And to, uh, and to really put into practice what many of us have, have used as a sort of loop service, but um, you know, that only us all, all voices are needed, um, that, that we really do need to have all voices and to, and to tolerate and even to appreciate those different voices. You know, this, I, I want to bring it down to a really micro level for just a second. Sure. And, and I always, I feel like I always am running the risk of sounding again too Pollyanna-ish if I give an example like this, but it feels like, it just feels essential to this discussion to, um, there was a really interesting phenomenon that happened in the, I think the mid 90s, and I won't use names and I won't, uh, I won't even say the streets that I, the street that I'm talking about in Leeds, but there was a street in Leeds with a very conservative older couple that you know were definitely old hamp. They had been their families had been in uh, in Leeds for several generations, and the street that they lived on was starting to change demographically. Um, a number of lesbian couples moved in to, onto the street, and there was a sense that it was becoming a lesbian street, as it were. And there wasn't much communication between this older couple and these new, uh, these new residents of the street. And an interesting thing happened. The, the wife of the couple got very sick. She had cancer, and she was dying for a long time. And it was those neighbors, those new, that new demographic, that came every day and brought food to the couple and became very close with this woman as she was dying and with her husband, who was kind of a stalwart conservative, was angry that these people were moving into his neighborhood. But when they started working at that level together, when he saw their compassion for him and his wife, when they saw the care that uh, these women were taking, bringing food and, and really caring for him as well, his, his political, cultural, social perception changed completely, and he became really close with many of these new couples that had moved in on this street. And so again, that's a that's an absolutely microcosmic example of the ways in which shifts can happen, but I think there, it's, it's a really important um, microcosmic example of how those shifts need to happen, that we see each other as people, that we are neighbors who are helping each other through good and through bad. In Leeds, we have um, a block party every year. We have all kinds of events every year, and everybody comes, and it's really lovely. It doesn't matter whether you voted for the override or you didn't vote for the override. You know, the person behind the grill cooking the hamburgers is an arch conservative and the, the people that he's talking to and serving are, you know, arch progressives. So that's that's the kind of stuff that gives me hope around city politics. Well, I, I think it's a wonderful example and and it is what we can do in neighborhoods and, and the people are willing to do it. I think that was a that was a beautiful example. That under under whatever labels we carry ourselves. And it's not to say you know, a variation of the color lines, but it's really to say we, we are this we are this multi color, we are this multi fabric world. And uh, without all of us, I heard of the people in the Starbucks that when she was here last spring, she 
was talking about how we really need to keep a vision of the kind of world we want and actually and to live in today. Because we can't say, oh, in the future I'm going to do these good things that I can help. And um, then she said, she said, she said um, there are people who say that the world would be quite fine without things. <laughs> For me, again, here goes the Pollyanna thing, but I think it's a lot about kindness and care and listening to one another and um, and not just reacting, you know, feeling like we need to open ourselves to hearing what people's concerns are. And we're not going to agree with them all the time, but it's finding the compassion to just kind of listen to people and try and figure out solutions together. And I think that's, that's certainly probably the thing we need right now is that compassion because times are hard. Um, I think we're getting better soon. And uh, we're all in this together. That it may look like someone who may be a little better off or like it was a nice bad off or whatever it is, but we're all in it together and we're not going to get through it without all of us. So have you have some last thoughts or <laughs> No, I, I really appreciate your having me on the show. It's a great show. I listen always, and uh, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm very glad you're here. You know, I'm very impressed with you. Pocky. And um, if anybody's interested in more information about the campaign that we're running, uh, please go to votealisa.com. It's vote, A-L-I-S-A, dot com. So we're about to sign up, but I'll let you know that we're, I sometimes feel like this 4 o'clock show is the, uh, is the opener for any good women democracy in the house, because it comes out the world, but the crowd is new students. That I said the campaign? Are you serious? I wasn't. I couldn't do that. Well, I, I don't know. I'll find out. Oh. Um, Does that doesn't it just mean you have to give equal airtime to Gene or something if, like if that? If he wants it, yeah. 